Hello, thank you for being here and thanks to the Risk 5 team for the opportunity to be speaking with you. My name is Shaheen Khan. I'm with a consultancy here in Silicon Valley called Orion X. Our website is orionx.net and I encourage you to go check it out and see all the different things that we're doing. So I want to start with one of my favorite quotes and that is when things change, they're not the same anymore. I don't know who said it, but I've been using it pretty regularly since I first heard it many years ago and nothing changes things in a good disruptive way like a real revolution does. And over the course of human history, we've gone through many revolutions, but there have been a few that have been human-wide across the entire spectrum, and they have really changed things in fundamental ways. The three that we really focus on are the agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution, and now the information revolution that we are really at the early stages of. Every time these things happen, they change the economy, they change the social model, they change a whole lot of things in the, in the, in the, in the world. Uh, they solve a bunch of problems, they create some other problems to be left to solve by subsequent revolutions that, that might happen. Uh, and they also don't leave everything behind. Like when we had industrial revolution, we had mechanized agriculture. And now that we have the information revolution, we have digital farming or digital manufacturing. So we, everything is brought forward. And as it is brought forward, it is uh, creating new opportunities and new markets. Now, each one of these has an enabler. Whereas for the agricultural revolution, the enabler was maybe just a plow and harnessing animals to help uh, make it happen. With industrial revolution, the enabler was the steam engine and the idea that you could mechanize things and build a motor that can help things. And now with the information revolution, the enabler is the microchip. And it is what all of you guys build and it is what's going to be driving this entire next phase of humanity for probably ever. Now, when these things happen, uh, what do they change? They change everything. Usually they start out by changing wars because they change technologies that can be readily used against the other guy and you know one-up them. And we are seeing some of the information warfare that we are observing on a daily basis around the world. They change the nature of work and the meaning of work. Uh, there was no factory job before there was a factory. There was no five to nine, nine to five job before there were like offices and, and, and corporations. And as we go into the information age, the meaning of the job is kind of starting to break. And, and the gig economy is uh, simultaneously becoming a problem for some as well as a, a source of freedom for others. Uh, health, laws, art, even the spirituality changes. Uh, these revolutions also create a gap. They create a gap between the complexity of the new world order that we need to catch up with as humanity and often do so in short order and the capability that we have to do so. So that gap is really the painful period when these transitions where the complexity of what we're dealing with exceeds uh, our competence to be able to address them. Uh, and that also requires a lot of work. So information age is all about data and it's about extraction of the data, the interpretation of the data and uh, processing of the data, whether it's for control or for governance or for commerce. And that has really led to some of the big trends that we see in the market right now. In terms of extraction, it reminds us of IoT, how the data gets communicated is probably through something like 4G or 5G or LT or other forms of communication. Uh, how you make sense of the data and how you make sense of models that allow us to predict the future is through artificial intelligence and high performance computing where you apply physics and math to natural phenomena and business processes to try to make sense of things. And of course, the IT systems that we see in terms of cloud computing and uh, cybersecurity and other forms are driving the implementation and use of that. Now, the other thing to really notice is that the sources of data have been shifting. Uh, source of data used to be companies, then it became people. It used to be systems, and now it is things. And every time another source of data gets added, entire industries are created. Entire, you know, multi-hundred billion dollar industries with new players and new winners uh, start emerging, probably within a good five, 10 years after these uh, pivot points are achieved where you extract the information content about things, you structuralize it, you build applications that manipulate it and bring value out of it. And all of this is really builds the 
foundation for a data economy that is emerging. So the future really is about digital transformation for us, and digital transformation is fundamentally about computability. There are things that are suddenly computable. Intelligence is computable. Trust is computable. Uh, contracts and agreements are just another kind of code. Value uh, in terms of financial services or just transferring value from one place to another is now instant and way lower cost than it, than it was in the past. The enterprise that we've known and loved is now becoming an extended enterprise like a fabric. So we call it enterprise as a system, a concept that was talked about even a few decades ago, but it's starting to become a reality. And all of this is really a giant opportunity and a threat. If you do it and you do it right, you'll be good for the next couple of decades. If you don't do it right and it turns out you had to, that can really be bad news for an organization. So one of our own quotes within Orion X is that the future is IoT, blockchain, quantum, AI, where machines, bots, DAOs, that stands for Digital Autonomous Organizations, and DAPs for decentralized applications, do most of the creating, consuming, and paying. So it is important to understand that one thing that we are building in all of this stuff in the digital economy is a pool of digital stuff kind of interacting with each other, and they're not even doing it for our benefit. And we may or may not have a toe in that pool, but there's a whole bunch of technologies that we're creating that are not really even for human use. They are for the use of machines so that they can get done what they need to get done and they can transact with each other in a way that, that, that we want them to. So in all of this, does hardware matter? We've just come off of a couple of decades where we were told hardware doesn't matter. Now, why does it not matter? Well, because the software stack is becoming taller and taller and taller. And if your application is sitting on top of that tall stack, it has no clue what chip it's running on anyway. So you, know, you might as well like not worry about it. Open source in software has created many layers that are suddenly accessible to everybody. You don't have to go worry about a, you know, legal contract or negotiation. So you can port it to whatever hardware you might have. Now, that may be a pretty difficult thing to do for one person or a small company, but it's quite doable for these large public cloud companies that have the wherewithal to get an entire software stack and actually fill the gaps if they need to and port it to whatever hardware that they, they, that they want. And indeed, they are doing that. And that has allowed simultaneously for hardware to not matter, but it has allowed new applications to be written. And of course, we now have AI and IoT and 5G and a few other trends that are causing these new applications to happen. And guess what? For that very reason, paradoxically, hardware suddenly does matter. Why? Because these new applications have performance requirements and the software stack is kind of turtles all the way down as, as, as the joke is, or they have environmental requirements or power requirements and things like that. And of course, all of this is leading to a giant new market. This whole data economy is about data being the new oil. You've got bits that represent information, interacting with atoms, representing things. The things have a digital twin. The information has a physical twin. And data economy is like in the middle governing it all. And when you look at the flow of data from inception to edge, from edge to cloud, from cloud to, as I said, to control, commerce, or governance, you can see the beginning of a data supply chain forming with a data flow and a workflow that matches it. And it may or may not match a physical supply chain, but it does fuel the emergence of these giant markets, IoT, 5G, cloud, AI, and crypto, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what are we gonna go build in those things? We have a framework that kind of tries to point out to all the great things that we've done in the semiconductor market, but also some of the new emerging things that can promise new advances. So we have a two by two essentially, and that is classical on one end, quantum at the other end, digital on one side, and analog on the other side. And the upper left-hand side quad is really where we have been with all the laws that we have uh, basically gone through, Moore's law and you know, Dennard scaling and this, that, and the other with parallelism and replication and environmentals and uh, power consumption, et cetera, et cetera. But we also now have mixed signal uh, technology coming that combines analog and digital and can solve a lot of problems really incredibly well 
and some use cases are emerging that are very interesting, as you all know. Uh, and also on the quantum computing, whether it's a quantum gate model or quantum annealing model, those are all giant opportunities in our coming years. So hardware matters and matters in a big giant way. Now, there is one more thing that the revolutions change and that is culture. Now, culture is really is the part that is interesting to me because it is how things get done, not just what gets done. Now, the agricultural revolution was governed by the realities of the land. Anybody that does farming figures out pretty quickly that there are some non-negotiables. If you want to be a successful farmer, you got to do this and you got to do that. And there's like, can't, you can't. And if you don't do them, you, 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 know, you get your lesson and then you do do them. And your culture shifts over time to match the requirement of farming. And that's planning and the discipline and execution where family was originally the team before it kind of became industrialized uh, farming. And it was ready for mechanization. Industrial revolution was governed by the realities of the machine, and we needed to organize ourselves and learn about operations. You know, you heard that story about a plane crash, and the reason apparently it did so is because the pilot and the co-pilot could not communicate with each other because of some cultural requirements. Well, guess what? Those cultural requirements are going to have to go away if you're going to fly planes around, and indeed, they do go away. And that's why around the world, various societies are starting to sooner or later catch up with the requirements of industrialization and do the right things. And now they're ready for automation. And with same thing is gonna happen with information age and we are not dealing with the realities of data, whether it's empowerment or collaboration or flexibility or indeed the problems that come with it, like I had a few slides ago about mistrust and attention and validity of the data and all of it. So we're learning all of that as a community and, and, and community is the team. And that's really how you're going to uh, be ready for optimization. And that's exactly kind of what defines risk five as a beacon of this new way of doing things for a, for a, for a very well-established market. Now within the semiconductor world, there have been two different ways of building things. One is really uh, what I call embrace the silo. Pick one stack and iterate and perfect it and perfect it some more. The other way has been the open way, embrace the chaos, if you will, where you do a best of breed and you try to integrate. It's a great model, but it is expensive and keeping everything consistent is very difficult. So one of the innovations that we see with information age and the culture of information age is indeed the new model, which I call aligned diversity, where the framework for consistency and compatibility and, 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 and uh, advancement is there, but it allows you to go do a lot of different things that is within that model. And I think that's the way of the future for a very good while. So I'm gonna leave you with one more quote, and that is, change is easiest when it is your own idea. Now, if you're on the, my own idea part of change, then it's not even change. You were the one being the change agent and the difficulty is for everybody else who needs to catch up with that. So this is in a way kind of a congratulations to this community that is driving the kind of change that really represents the future. So with that, I pause, I thank you for your attention and I look forward to interacting with you online and offline. Look forward to it. Thank you so much.